I've kind of been amazed at um, how compatible we are and just how we see eye to eye on everything. It, it, it's, it's really kind of like, wow, man. And so I, I just kind of took out a pad of paper the other day and I said, well, I'm, is there anything that, like, man, she might think one way and I would think one way in our lives and our marriage? And I started writing down a few, making the bed, arranging the pillows, <laughs> floating the furniture, hanging up my shirts, loading the dishwasher, dryer, and washing machine, feeding the dogs, maintaining the right temperature in the house, handling the finances, discussing issues, folding the towels, driving the car, taking the garbage out, bringing garbage cans in, how Charlie cuts my hair, buying groceries, taking vitamins, talking on the telephone with the kids, drinking with or without a straw, choosing a place to eat out, how I act in public, <laughs> expressing affection, organizing the closet, planning ahead, making plans, and when to leave to get somewhere on time on everything else, man, we are together. <laughs> and then one other one was just telling cute family stories in the sermon where we have decided that I'm supposed to uh, say, before I tell that story, based on a true story, as they do in the movies. I think the situation where sometimes we get at odds, the biggest, the most, perhaps the worst, is driving in the car. And like one person is driving and one person has the GPS and you know, you're kind of under the pressure of turning at the right place and going at the right place. And this person over here is giving instructions. I mean, that's the only place that we really ever raised our voice and that kind of stuff. And then I'd like to tell you a story about a time where we disagreed and it worked out best. This is Christmas of 2004 and you've heard me reference this story. This is based on a true story. Um, I, I, we had a fire in our fireplace, which is, that's okay, you know, and, and the, by the next morning we were having company. It was actually Christmas morning and a lot of you have heard this before, but I just use it for an impact. Um, I took the, the uh, coals out and they weren't quite cold and my wife kind of said hey you know maybe you better not put them where you're going to put them because they're not quite you know the caution of your wife well I, I said well it'll be okay and so I put the coals in the um, in the trash can beside the house now this is how I told it and you've heard me told it and the result of all that was on Christmas morning I burnt my house down and my wife said that day that I told that, you didn't burn the house down. The house was still up. And then I said, well, there was $130,000 of damage to rebuild the house. So however you want to look at that. And uh, so if I had listened to the caution of my wife, we wouldn't have had a house fire nine years ago. But I could come back to her and say, well, Jackie, if I had listened to your cautions, we wouldn't have had a newly modeled $130,000 remodeled job. So, you know, these things kind of float around. On everything else besides those I've mentioned, we uh, see eye to eye. And, you know, I thought about it. If it's not going to happen after 42 years of marriage, maybe it would be a good conclusion to say probably won't ever happen. I mean, Jackie and I might not ever see eye to eye on every issue. Is that a fair statement? But is that what God wants, to see eye to eye on every single issue? Think about this. If I had been successful in making Jackie think the way I think on every issue, I would have been successful in conforming her into my image, right? And we try to do that a lot. And we get into fights and quarrels. 
because we feel like you need to do it like I do it or they need, you know, that kind of deal. And really, we have this thing in our heart where we want to conform our spouse into our own image. That she would look more like me or that I would look more like her. And the interesting thing about the Bible, the message that we preach is that there is a higher power. His name is Jesus. And God's plan for us is that I, not that I'm conformed into the image of my wife or my wife is conformed into the image of Brother Dick, but that we are by God's grace and by his Holy Spirit conformed into the image of the Son. Amen. And as we're conformed into the image of the Son, everything else goes good. So I came upon a passage It kind of describes, I think, some of the things that Jackie and I have been through. I've never used this passage before, teaching about marriage, but boy, as I got into it, James chapter 4, starting in verse 1, as I got into it, man, it was like a mirror, you know? I saw myself in this mirror, and it did not come out very well for me. I didn't like what I saw. But how many of you know the Word of God is often a mirror for us? And if we look into that mirror and pay attention to what we see and do what needs to be done about what we see, it will go better for us. Let's read through the passage together. You can look as they put the slides on the screen, or you can look in your Bible. We're just going to read it straight down, verse after verse, and then we'll come back and look at it again. Again, I... Uh, Never seen this in the same light as I think the Holy Spirit showed it to me this week in light of focus on the marriage, focus on the family. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. What causes fights <laughs> and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Spirit anointing upon the Word of God. We thank you for the body of Christ that is gathered together today to receive the word of God. I thank you, Father, that you've touched my heart through this passage. And I pray, Father, that I could be faithful and accurate to portray and to communicate by the power of the Spirit the message that you have for this wonderful body of Christ meeting here today. We thank you for what you're going to do, the change that's going to come into our hearts in Jesus' name, I pray. As we look at verse 1, it kind of identifies some fussing and some fighting. And the context, again, is not marriage, but let's go through it and see what it looks like. What causes fights and quarrels among you? You know, this week or this month, we're, we're kind of majoring on the word reconciliation. And reconciliation is that thing that takes place when there's two parties involved and something comes between them and they're reconciled when what is between them is removed so that they can have relationship. We were reconciled to God. We were reconciled to God when what was between us, sin, was taken care of by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ bore our sin in his body on the tree. It was taken away. Therefore, we could be related to God. And sometimes things come between a husband and a wife. And reconciliation is the need of the hour. That thing that separates us needs to be dealt with so that we can have that relationship again. So in verse 1, he's talking about wars. He's talking about fighting. He's talking about quarrels. And as I've been in the pastorate for over 30 years and been married for 42 years and grew up in a house where two people were married, my mom and dad, I've just seen that that describes a lot of marriages. Now, the degree of the fighting and the intensity of the fighting and the loudness of the quarrels may differ, but they are there. What causes fights and quarrels among you now just for a minute while we go through verse 1 2 and 3 i want you to do something quit thinking about him or her and start thinking about who you because i believe that this passage clearly places the responsibility for marriage issues on you the individual now i realize that that guy out there or that woman out there that spouse out there or that person out there is not perfect and they have trouble but let's for a few minutes could we just kind of major on you because the interesting thing is in a marriage if God takes care of you things start getting better and you're not responsible really for changing him or her as much as you are responsible to stand before God and take care let God take care by grace by the power of his Holy Spirit take care of you so the Bible says what causes fights and quarrels among you it doesn't point the finger at the other person it says don't they don't the fights and quarrels among you don't they come from your desires that battle within you so it's clearly placing the responsibility for a fight or a quarrel on desires evil lusts that battle within you The battle that's taking place is the battle between the Christian who has the spirit in them but is battling with the evil desires of the flesh. Selfishness, pride, me, mine, all these things. In verse 1 it says the desires that battle within you, those desires that come out of the flesh, that's what causes fights and quarrels. Verse 2 goes on with that thought. You desire, but do not have, so you kill. By the way, hating is the same as killing in the New Testament. Verse 2, you desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Let's stop there and just put verse 1 and the first half of verse 2 together, and it's almost like we get back to the playground effect. You know, I mean, here's this kid over here, and here's this kid over here, and he wants something, and this kid has it, and they want something, and they're just fighting. And it's just kind of immature. And, And I'm not saying that there's not reasons for us to fight in our relationship, not fight, just disagree. There's never a reason to fight necessarily, but that this is what many marriages look like. I mean, I have this tool that, that I, I minister to people, and they look at 10 areas of their relationship, and they respond to a bunch of statements in their relationship. And basically, this tool shows where they have a difference of opinion. I mean, if I... It, 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 and and um, so it, it, it kind of kind of shows where, hey, maybe there could be a quarrel. Maybe there could be a disagreement. Maybe there could be a, a fight. Now, granted that the language used in verses 1 and 2 describing killing and hating and all these things, maybe that's not in your marriage, but I guess I'm just pointing to the fact that as Jackie and I have 25 areas that we do not agree with, if the success of our marriage is based upon finding out who's right and who's wrong in those 25 areas, then we're not going to be very successful in our marriage. Is that right? If who's right is the key to the success of your marriage, you're just conforming the, your, your spouse into your image, right? You're saying, well, you've got to think like I do. 
And so the result, I think, is these evil desires in verse 1. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want to be right. You want to get what you want. It's this selfishness and all these things. And I've looked at over my relationship with my wife over 42 years, and I'm saying, Amira, I want what I want. And I want you to give it to me. I come to my spouse and I say, I want you to give it to me. And there's a whole range of things that that could include. Verse 2, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Now, are y'all okay with me saying, hey, that's kind of mirror describing marriages sometimes. I see a lot of nodding heads, okay. Some of you got uh, a good nod from our associate pastor's wife. <laughs> Some nods over here. The good news is you can nod and smile. Yes, Dick. Selfishness. Come on, raise your hand. Just say it. I'm a selfish person. My inner being, that old man, that, that old man without Christ, I want it now. I want you to give it to me. And you're, you know, that's, and it's just this playground mentality where, you know, an elevation takes place. You say something, and then this person says something, and and then, you know, it's just like that. And I think this can characterize to a certain degree all of our marriages. And then the second half of verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Now, as I thought about this and the Holy Spirit worked on me a little bit, it's like the reason I don't have is because I'm looking to my spouse to give to me what I need to go to God for. Amen? It says you do not have because you do not ask. And the Bible says, having you, O Lord, I desire nothing on earth. So that mature Christian person is not trying to get something from their spouse. They're going to the Lord. You don't have because you do not ask God. So I would suggest to you that some of you, perhaps there's fighting and quarreling going on and you want to just throw your hands up sometime and divorce, never, murder, maybe, could be something that you'd jokingly say. But praise God, this is not right. And I guess this kind of introduces the idea that we're trying to get from our spouses what we can only get from God. Amen? God has created us to give to our spouses, not get from our spouses. And man, I'm telling you, I've looked in this thing and in this face comes before me in the mirror and it's my face and I'm thinking well, what do I try to get from Jackie that I need to go to God and man if I can get God has it let me just say you have not because you ask not you you don't ask God for what you want and and maybe I could encourage you to start looking up for what you need instead of there for what you need so then, if, and because we're, we're in this kind of fleshly state where selfishness is prevailing and pride is prevailing and, boy, we just want what we want and we lust for it and there's evil desires because of our sinful nature, it says, even when you ask, even when you go to God, you don't receive. First issue is you don't ask God. Second issue is when you ask, you don't get anything from God because what? You ask with the wrong motive, and your motive is just to get what you want so you can spend it on your pleasures, right? 
I mean, this is a description in verse 1, 2, and 3 of a carnal Christian, a fleshly Christian who is not filled with the Spirit, not walking in the Lord. He's full of evil desires. Selfishness is prevailing. He's asking the wrong way. He's asking his wife or his husband. He's not going to the Lord. And when he goes to the Lord, he's still selfish. He's just asking. He's praying for selfish stuff. And I mean, it's like, think about those three verses. Verse 4. Then that person gets a friend. That person that's fighting and quarreling and selfish and evil desires and asking amiss and not asking God, not in prayer. Look who he makes friends with verse 4 you adulterous people or in many versions it says you adulterers now what are we talking about you see there's two marriages that are in trouble right here you adulterers he's not talking about the marriage between the husband and the wife he's talking about the marriage unit union that is between the husband and the lord and the wife and the Lord. He's saying, you adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So here's this person in verse 1, 2, and 3 who's got these evil desires. He's doing everything wrong. Quarrels and, and factions and division are occurring in his ministry. And then it goes on to say, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That same person is just a worldly person. He loves the world. The world is attractive to him. All the world in its glitter, he's in love with the world. And as this person falls in love with the world, he becomes an enemy of God. I've often said that the problem with the marriage is just an indication of your problem with God. And this passage seems to link quarrels and difficulties and stresses and strains in a marriage back to your relationship to God. Because it first talks about prayer. It says when you, you, you don't have because you don't ask God, you don't go to God, you go to your spouse. And then it says, and when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives so you can get what you want and spend it on your pleasures. And then it calls you and I adulterers. It says, man, we have broken the marriage union with God. We've fallen in love. We've started having an illicit sexual affair with the world rather than God. I mean, that's what it says here. You adulterers. It's a spiritual relationship with, with the world instead of a relationship with God. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means adult, means um, means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And, you know, it's like, man, this is, this is kind of hard stuff, especially as you think about marriage. But, and I, 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 I'm not applying this universally and saying everybody who's having a difficult marriage, this applies to you. I'm just saying, for a little while, let's think about whether it applies to you. And if it just applies to your spouse and not to you, uh, we can give you grace. But, man, I, I want you to really examine yourself. Is this why there are quarrels and fights among you? And I thought, man, is this why Jackie and I don't have the marriage that God wants us to have? And it, to me, it's... A mirror. So we've left our relationship with the Lord. The adulterous relationship is, is an illicit affair with someone else. Instead, we're, it's, it's not describing us leaving our spouse. It's describing us leaving God and falling in love with the world. Now, let me just uh, 
speak to you a minute about the three enemies of the Christian walk. The first enemy of the Christian walk really is, is mentioned in verse 1, 2, and 3. It's the sinful nature. It's the flesh with all the evil desires. These desires battle within you. Who knows what the second enemy of a strong Christian walk is? It's the world. It's friendship with the world. The Bible says if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So these verses just go down. They first talk about, hey, the problem is with you. It's with your sinful fleshly nature. You have not crucified it and given yourself totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, man, you've fallen in love with the world. You're an adulterer. You've left your relationship with the Lord and you've fallen in love with the world. Verse 5 goes on to say, Or do you think that Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? In other words, God loves you. He's a jealous God. He longs for you. And when you fall in love with the world, he's longing. He's jealous. He wants you. He wants you to have relationship to him. So we have this relationship to the world, and it brings out a jealous God, and that God longs for the Spirit. He has cause to dwell in us. He put that Spirit in us. He put that Spirit in us, and He longs for that Spirit to dwell with Him. And then the good news, it kind of starts turning, but in verse 6, He gives us more grace. So this is kind of the turning point in the passage. The passage is basically saying, point the finger at yourself when you're evaluating your marriage or really any other relationship you have. Point your finger at yourself. Think about your sinful nature with its evil desires and its thoughts. And then think about your relationship to the world. Have you fallen in love with the world and the things of the world? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So all of a sudden, I started thinking as I went through these verses, I said, man, God's putting a thermometer in our mouths, and he's saying the thermometer is not to measure how good or bad the marriage is. The marriage is the thermometer that gauges how good our relationship with God is. And if our marriage is in trouble, the first place we need to go is where? We need to go to our wife and husband. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But the first place we need to go is back to God. Amen? And he's the one that touches us. And God, you know, it's not good if one spouse is going to the Lord and one spouse is not. But it's better than if if neither are going to the Lord. So I I started thinking, well, Lord, if, if, if there's quarreling or if there's fighting or if there's fussing or if there's enmity between me and my wife, then that's an indication that I've got a problem with you. It kind of boils down. Or, or I, I've got a problem. I love the world. In other words, I haven't dealt with that sinful, selfish nature. And, and I've fallen in love with the world. And what's really hurting here is my marriage. And God is jealous for you to come back. And it says in verse 6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud. I I don't know how to express to you what what I've felt. I mean... Men, maybe this is just personally for men, you know. Ladies, you can listen, of course. But men, we are proud men. And we walk in pride. And I can tell when pride is rearing its ugly head. I don't want Jackie to tell me what to do. I don't want to hear her advice. I don't want to be patient with her. I don't want to be kind to her. I just want my way. And it's almost a, a force inside of me. And the Bible says, man, when I'm proud toward my wife, if there's any pride in me, the Bible says God is standing opposing me. 
how can we have a good marriage when we allow pride to stay around? And the Bible says God opposes the proud. And guys, I mean, I'm sure that women get proud too, but I think it's more like on our part that we just think that we're right and we think that we know it all or we think that we don't need anybody, we don't need our wife, we don't need our God, we can do it, I, 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 you know, that's just some of the symptoms of pride. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's me. So, to me, the cause of quarrels, difficulties in marriages come from two things. Number one, it comes from that sinful nature. It comes from pride. It comes from I, me, mine. I want what I want now. And it comes from our friendship with the world. And it seems like if we want to have better marriages, if we want to have better relationships in general, that we got to repent of that relationship with the world and we got to repent. You know, the world will tell you a bunch of stuff about marriage that's just crazy. Valentine's Day. I mean, what does that say about marriage? I mean, it's just not really the biblical message that marriage between the two Christians is a sacrificial relationship where we put God first and he does this work in our life and we come together for his glory. And Valentine just kind of says, well, just light a candle and buy some nice new clothes and, and take her out to dinner. And praise God, I hope all of y'all do that. Amen. I hope I do that. But there's something deeper, there's something deeper when things are not going well, candles and nice clothes and romantic evenings, they all fall apart. There's something deeper in here that's causing these quarrels and fights, and it's that sinful nature that's not been dealt with, and it's that friendship with the world that makes us an adulterer toward our God and when we're standing in that situation, the only thing that can help is repentance, revival, renewal. Come, Holy Spirit, fill me up. And that's what the Bible starts talking about in verse 7. It says, hey, God's going to oppose the proud, but he's going to give grace to the humble. So here's my 10 steps to a good marriage. They're right here. First, submit. Second, resist. Third, come near. Fourth, wash. Fifth, purify. Six, seven, and eight, grieve, mourn, wail. Nine, change. And number ten, humble yourselves before the Lord. In other words, I believe that in my relationship to my wife, my relationship to the Lord is the important thing. I know that's not just brand new revelation, but man, let me just go a little bit into these 10 steps. Submit yourselves then to God. If this is your problem, if you're quarreling, if you're having fussing and you're having fighting and you've wanted to have a better relationship, you've wanted to make progress in your marriage, but something's keeping you back, it's basically the sinful nature and it's basically friendship with the world. And here's where we start getting lined up again under God. Submit yourselves then to God. You place yourself under God. That deals with our pride. Because when we submit ourselves to God, we're saying, I cannot do this. So we place ourselves under God. We resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. You know, it's interesting to me, the three enemies of a successful Christian life are the flesh, the world, and the devil. And the Bible says that if we'll take care of the flesh... And if we'll take care of our friendship with the world, all we have to do with the devil is resist him and he will flee. Amen. When the devil came to Jesus and said, hey, do this, do this, do this. Jesus quoted the word of God. There was nothing in Christ that, G that the devil had a part of. And Jesus resisted the devil. And the Bible says the devil came back or went away for a more opportune time. So here it is, we've, we've, we're, we're taking care of our flesh, we're 
dealing with our friendship to the world, we're submitting ourselves then to God, and we're resisting the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, if the devil comes to you, and if I could use this, this terminology, and I, I hope it, it, it's, it's, if, if you're in bed with your sinful nature, and if you're in bed with the world, those are the first two enemies, if you're hanging out with them, the devil comes, and man, he's got free entry. And he knows how to work with the sinful nature. He knows how to work with friendship to the world. And he becomes this threefold cord that's not easily broken. The world, the sinful nature, and the devil. And so the first step in getting out of that is to submit yourselves then to God. The second step is to resist the devil. If he comes and he sees somebody that's hanging out with God, has dealt with the sinful nature, has not been transformed to this world, he doesn't have a place there. And you just resist him and praise God, he goes. Now I think there's some of us that need to just start in our marriage to say, man, I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to resist the devil and he's going to flee from my house. And he's not going to have authority here. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Praise God. Today we came near. In verse 8, it says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Come near to God. And the promise is, if you'll take that step toward God, I believe there's some people here today who are uh, identifying with some of these thoughts on marriage, and th it's just like, hey, I, I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to resist the devil. I'm going to draw near to God. And in faith, I'm going to believe that he will draw near to me. And boy, you're, on, you're, you're kind of moving ahead toward marriage improvement. Submit yourselves then to God, number one. Resist the devil, number two. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And the next one is wash your hands. Now, we're not talking about clean hands. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart from the Psalms. So we wash our hands. We're getting rid of the moral filthiness that we've allowed to come into our lives. We're getting rid of things that we don't need. We're washing our hands of the things that we need to wash our hands of. We're offering up to the Lord clean hands. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. I mean, it, it's like, oh, well, Brother Dick, can you help us with our marriage? You know, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, this passage is drawing us into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I guess the verse that is kind of stuck in my mind a lot is verse 9. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Grieve, mourn, and wail. And I guess I would just like to say to you that I, I wouldn't say that in this message you've heard something that's just brand new. Most of you would realize that when your marriage starts going sour, it's because one of you or both of you have lost your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not walking in intimacy with the Lord, and the result of that, the fruit of not being with the Lord, is quarreling and arguing and not having a good relationship with your wife. And I don't think that's a new message, but I guess there's just a seriousness that I would like to introduce into this issue, and it comes from verse 9, greed. I mean, you know, some of us say, well, man, marriage is not going very well and I'm going to try a little harder and, and I guess what I'd like to say in grieving, mourning and wailing, let God show you the condition of your relationship with your spouse. Let him baptize you with an anguish the anguish that he feels. Why would God have an anguish as he looks at a broken marriage or a troubled marriage or a marriage that's not doing very well? Because he, his plan for marriage is to place a marriage on the earth where a man leaves his father and mother and the two become one flesh. 
He has put that on earth to give the world a picture of Christ and the church. So every divorce, every troubled marriage, every quarreling, every argument that goes on in a marriage because of a sinful nature and friendship to the world, all of that defames the church. It makes the church look bad. It makes the body of Christ the head of the church. It takes away what God wants that picture to look like. And so God is in this anguish over the condition of, I'll say it, my marriage. And I want him to baptize me, fill me with an anguish, a hurt, a pain, a grief, a wailing, a mourning for my marriage. That's what's called true repentance. Things start happening when we give more than lip service to this thing called marriage improvement, when we ask God to give us his thoughts and his view and his perspective on what's happening behind the closed doors of our house, and he opens our eyes to see our marriage like he sees it, and we enter into that anguish, that grieving, that mourning, and that's called deep repentance, And out of that deep repentance, God starts doing things in our heart and we rise up in faith to love our wives and to submit to our husbands and to do all the things that God would have for our marriage. I give you a quick example of this in Nehemiah chapter 1. I think the guys have it on there. It's just two verses, but here's, here's a picture of what probably hasn't happened in many of our marriages, but needs to happen in our marriages. Amen? Nehemiah is over in the Old Testament. Look at chapter 1 in Nehemiah, verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. A group of men had gone to Jerusalem to see the condition of the city. Verse 3, they said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. We're not going to go into the background or the details. We're just saying that the report came to Nehemiah that the city of Jerusalem was in great trouble and disgrace. They go on to say the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, Nehemiah was in a very comfortable position. Nehemiah was, had, a, had a cushy job. Nehemiah was making good money. He was over here in the gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was way over there. And he didn't have to really be that concerned about it. He, but, but God showed him what he wanted to show him. And look what happens in verse 4. When I heard these things. In other words, when I got the report of what was happening in Jerusalem, when I heard these things, I sat down, I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. In other words, there was this anguish in his heart. He saw the downtrodden Jerusalem the same way that God saw it. And he repented, he sat down, he wept, he mourned, he fasted for days. And I would suggest to you that some of us, our marriages are in trouble because we really haven't gotten serious about repenting from the things that have made our marriages not what God wants them to be. And we've just given lip service to marriage improvement. And this is what God, this is kind of like a picture. Man, what's the report of your marriage? Amen. What's God's report on your marriage? Is it kind of needing some some straightening up? Are the walls broken down? Is it burned? Is it in big trouble, little trouble? If it's in trouble, man, and I would suggest that the men need to take the initiative on this. Man, what's the report of your marriage? Is it bad? Is it needing improvement? Do you need to make progress? Are you fasting? Are you praying? Are you mourning? Are you weeping? Are you wailing? Are you repenting to that degree before the Lord? 
I don't know. I just, it, 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 it's just time to get serious about this family deal. If you don't get serious about your family, nobody else is going to get serious about your family, right? It's time to change. It's time to handle the stuff that needs to be handled. You know, I even put it in context. We're going to have this worldwide evangelism speaker come to Cornerstone in March, and I'm getting more and more excited about it as I read his book. I started reading it yesterday, and I said, man, we are in for something in March as we emphasize missions and evangelism and doing our part in the world, doing our part in Baton Rouge, doing our part in Central to reach out to the lost people in Christ. And I thought, well, man, God, fix our marriages before we, you know, we got to have a good, amen. And I, it, it got, God just put the marriage thing in my marriage. I mean, I, I want it to be everything it's to be to before God. And then I want God to send me out to win people to Christ but I want to have that solid foundation before. Uh, and so I, I think that in, in the Lord's sovereignty, he put, he put family focus before world focus. We're going to get our families worked on a little bit. And then we're going to focus on the world. So Nehemiah could be a picture. The walls were broken down and Nehemiah got serious. And God used Nehemiah, by the way, in 53 days. The walls of Jerusalem, the amazing big walls of Jerusalem were built up. So we go back to James chapter 9, chapter 4, verse 9, and we finish up. And I, I, I've given something to two of the guys, and I'd like for them to just uh, quietly walk through the congregation as I finish my message and and uh, just give one of these little cards to, to and I, I need one first, please, uh, to every married couple. So I'm going to ask them to do that now. And I, I'd just like for you to really focus with me over the next five minutes as we, we think about our own marriages. This is an important time. Right now is an important time in your marriage. I, I don't know how you've related to what I've spoken. I've tried to be faithful to the kind of the anguish that has risen in my heart for my marriage and, and for your marriage and for our church's marriage. And I've come to grips with the idea that, boy, if our marriages are in trouble, it means our relationship with God is in trouble and we need to turn back to God and we need to repent and these things that I'm, I'm relating now. And I, I'm thinking that this little piece of paper perhaps can be a focal point for you and your wife as we close our service. So in verse 9 it says, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. You know, I, I'm the first one to say, I mean, I even, I, as I came in this morning, I, I thought, well, Lord, do I want to start this message off with kind of a lightness? You know, here are 25 things that Jack and I don't agree with or don't agree on, and it's like, boy, do we need to laugh about these things? And and, and I, I'm, I'm the first one to get light in issues. You know, I'm the first one to make a joke. And I, I just sometimes think that maybe the Lord doesn't want me to be joking about things. And so it says, grieve, mourn, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, there's certainly times for joy, but man, maybe it's time for these kind of things to happen and then it says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. When we humble ourselves before the Lord, it's not a, a physical act, but sometimes a physical act can represent what we're doing in our heart, man. We're laying low before the Lord, and we're saying, Lord, if you don't do this, I can't do it. I, I mean, it's just this admission that I can't love my wife as Christ loved the church. Lord, I have messed this thing up. I, I need to, to make some progress here, but I can't make progress. And that's the humiliation of the soul, the humbling of the soul before God, declaring our dependence upon him. The proud man declares his independence. I'm an island. I don't need God. I don't need a thing. 
God opposes the proud, but what does he do for the humble? That person who bows his head, I mean, it's almost too simple. How do you, how do you humble yourself before God? You just get low before him and you say, God, I need you. If my marriage is going to work, if we're going to be the godly home, the godly family that you want us to be, the, it starts with us humbling ourselves before God and as we humble ourselves before God, the promise here is that He will lift us up. And, and when He lifts us up, it doesn't make us proud. Oh, look what I did in our marriage. When we humble ourselves before the Lord, and when the Lord lifts us up, it's not, look what I did in my marriage. God lifted me up, and I give Him all the glory and the credit. Amen? And then all of a sudden, man, it's not, oh, look what I did. It's, look what God did. I humbled myself before God. I said, I cannot do this. He filled me with the Spirit in a new way. He showed me the Word in a new way. He empowered me to do some things that I never could do on my own. He lifted me up. And you come on Sunday and you say, God did it. And I, I, just, I just know that's the first step in you and I having the marriages that will be the solid foundation for our children, for evangelism to the world, marriages that are solid in that. When's the last time you grieved, you mourned, and you wailed? Now, wailing, golly, man. That's a pretty strong word. I mean, the whale is this anguish of soul. Oh, you know, it's that. It's not an outward expression. It can manifest in an outward expression, but it's just this deep sense that God gives us when he grants us repentance, when he pours out his grace that you're sorry. I would suggest, man, that if you're in that position, you might be sitting beside your wife right now or your wife, you might be sitting beside your husband or if your spouse is not here, you're thinking about it. Maybe the first thing to do if this message is touching your heart is just to, to, to at the appropriate time, it, it's just to, to, to repent before God and then go to your wife or your spouse and say, honey, I, you know, this could be the talk over the, the lunch today. You know, it could be, honey, I am sorry. When's the last time that you just apologized to your wife or your spouse for the things that have gone wrong and your part in all of that, that sinful nature, that selfish sinful nature, that love for the world. I've been an adulterer. I've left my relationship with the Lord and I've had an illicit relationship with the world. And man, I'm ready to repent, and I want to tell you, honey, that I am sorry. And then I want to say the next step is to grab her hand and say, let's pray. I can't tell you how many couples that I have experienced in the past that just don't pray together. Well, I have my quiet time, and he has his quiet time. But I'm telling you, something happens when couples pray together. Now, there's a thousand dynamics operating in our sinful nature, in the world, in our lives that would keep us from praying together. One of them would be proud, pride. I don't, but, you know, the couple needs to pray together. And so I, I feel like this little card can be a, a help for, for that couple who, who really wants to have that marriage that God wants them to have. It's called the marriage prayer. What might God do? I'm just on this first page. What might God do if you said a simple prayer every day for your spouse? And um, open it up, and, and the ladies have a prayer that they could pray for their husband every day, and the husbands have a prayer that they could pray for their spouse every day. And I, I've been thrilled that this prayer that I didn't write, I mean, it, it, it kind of represents the passage. It says... I said, this is, this is like the ladies, this would be the prayer the ladies would pray for their husband. I said, Lord, till death do us part, I want to mean it. Help me love you, Lord, more than I love him. And him 
more than I love anyone or anything else. So that sets all the priorities in line. Help me love you first. Help me love him more than I love anything else. Help me bring him into your presence today. Lord, help me bring Jackie into your presence today. Jackie, let's get in the word. Let's get into prayer. Let's put a little tape on and worship the Lord a little bit. Let's just sing to the Lord. Let's get in the presence of the Lord today. Help me, it says, bring him into your presence. Make us one, like you are three in one. We don't have to worry about how she folds the clothes and how she hangs up the shirts. Make us one, Lord, in all the important things of life. And then it says, I want to hear him, support him, and serve him so he would love you more and we could bring you glory. Amen. For the guys, I said, till death do us part. I want to mean it. Help me love you, Lord, more than I love her and her more than anyone or anyone else. Help me bring her into your presence today. Make us one like you are, three in one. I want, Lord, to hear her. I want to cherish her. I want to serve her so she would love you more and we could bring you glory. Would you stand with me, please? Now, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody and I don't want anybody to, to, to feel uh, awkward. But I, I would like it, every husband, if you could just read this to the Lord, in the presence of of your wife and every wife if you could just read this to the Lord it's a prayer to the Lord in the presence of your husband and father I just pray that as as husbands and wives pray this simple prayer unto you in the presence of in each other's presence and in your presence, Father, that you would come and do healing, that you would come and do forgiveness. Lord, that you just come into that wedding, that marriage, Father, and that you do that good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, nobody's looking around. Guys, would you just take the hand of your wife? Wives, would you take the hand of your husband? I want the husband to go first. So guys, this one's for us. Would you pray this prayer to the Lord in the presence of your wife? And then after that, ladies, would you pray this prayer to the Lord in the presence of your husband? I'm going to do it with Jackie. Father, I say, hmm.